and uh, look like you and act like you and talk like you and think like you and learn. That's a, that's a major work and we just, uh, we just pray that you're, you'll help us to be yielded uh, to the wonderful Spirit of God uh, and the blessed Word of God that you provided us. Uh, Lord, we do want to praise you for um, the answer to prayers in relation to uh, Kathy's job. And we're so grateful that she's been able to get a job that seems to be very, very uh, beneficial for her and or grateful for it. We do want to thank you for the very good report that's come th uh, from Cheryl about her treatments. And we uh, are grateful that both Dan and Cheryl and what they're receiving have been working thus far. Uh, we do want to continue to pray for the conflicts that rage in both Ukraine and Israel. We just pray, Lord, that these things will come to an end with this year ending, that maybe the conflict will end and that um, people will come to their senses. Lord, we do want to pray for our nation. We do want to pray that there's a place for repentance and there's a place for uh, maybe reshaping uh, leadership. And um, we just pray that you might help our leaders to have humility before you and, uh, Lord, that they would function as you would you have designed government to function. We do want to thank you for our missionaries and we continually pray that you'll give them safety and opportunities to share Christ with those that do not know you. And Lord, give our military the uh, discernment and uh, uh, <clears throat> wisdom that they need and the decisions that need to be made. But Lord, we do want to pray for Gene Sims. We just pray that um, He'll be able to discover exactly what's been causing these many strokes for him. We're so grateful that there doesn't there doesn't seem to be any any uh, lasting problems for him. <clears throat> we just pray now that you'll um, help them to regulate whatever they need to, and that you'll uh, bring them uh, home safe and sound. We also want to pray for Karen, and, and as she keeps continually searching for what will help her and her sugar, uh, that she'll find some answers really really soon. And Lord, that they'll be able to regulate all that she needs. Lord, we do want to pray for Andrew and the uh, very difficult um, mindset that um, that he has in dealing with his condition. And we just pray, Lord, that you might help him and encourage the family and um, just uh, bless him in those special ways and help him to draw close to Christ. May he find that you are sufficient and also that you uh, you can help him with the troubles that he deals with. Lord, we do want to pray for Mark and the medications that he needs. We just pray you might help them to discover exactly what will really help him with all these seizures that he's been dealing with for years. And Lord, that you might help uh, Al's wife to uh, get over her sickness <coughs> and to get on the road to help. Uh, Lord, we do want to pray for um, um, Craig's mom, we don't really know what's going on, but we just know that uh, she needs uh, your help, and we pray that you'll um, intervene and help uh, her in a special way. Lord, we do want to pray for Ruth Ann's neighbor, for her mental, mental health, and uh, Lord, we don't really know uh, sometimes what's going on physically, uh, but we just pray that she'll get the help that she needs, and uh, Lord, that she'll be much, much better, and that in this process, she might turn to you in uh, uh, not just a system, but uh, somebody higher and greater uh, that she has uh, help from. Lord, we do want to pray uh, for um, Darla and my son, and both, the, um, both need uh, some help with marriage. Uh, and uh, Lord, uh, this, is, this is one of these great institutions that you have you have provided mankind. It is uh, something that should be uh, lasting a lifetime. Uh, we know that it doesn't. We know that there's very difficult um, situations and personalities that sometimes uh, change over the years and sometimes growing apart. And we just pray, Lord, that you might uh, bring these marriages together and that um, people will have the mindset and the obedience to do what is right in your sight. Lord, we do want to pray for um, uh, Larry and Tony as they both have been receiving uh, treatment. And uh, we just pray that um, these treatments will work well if you will uh, choose to sustain their lives through these. Uh, Lord, if you do not and you're calling them home, I just pray that you prepare their hearts 
and uh, that they are prepared their family. And sometimes, Lord, oh, it's sicknesses. It's sometimes not seen as merciful, but there are times times where sicknesses are merciful because they do prepare you for uh, for the time to go home to be with you, and it prepares family. And we just know that you will do that which is best in your sight. So, Lord, we'll submit all these requests before you, and we so look forward to our. Uh, to the time where you return and uh, that you take us home to be with you and we look forward to the rapture we look forward to um, the tribulation being over and you ruling and reigning and uh, that's what our world really needs and so until that time again we ask that you help us to be faithful through Jesus we pray amen Alrighty, we are on E in our study uh, the parable that we've been going over and we talked about the laborers the day laborers in the parable and they were desperate and knew that they needed someone to offer them work and they were poor they were meek they were devoid of resources and that kind of is the kind of spirit that the Lord really needs to actually work in a person's heart in a person's life that kind of spirit. And there's an opposite to that kind of spirit. We can see it in Revelation. Um, but God wants no one to be able to boast of deserving to be in his kingdom. So when he calls a person, the spirit of God gives that person an awareness of his desperate need of redemption. That's where we see the Spirit of God working. And so, in our question here, this is number one, do you think the neediness that God used to call a person is something that we should still be aware of before God, or as we grow in Christ, does it dissipate at all? Does the neediness still very much plays a very prevalent part or do we just does that dissipate a little bit well it depends on the situation too doesn't it what do you think I think it's always yeah. always we always need the price we always need to know where we've come from and we always need to know how, you know, the condition that we've been saved from. So I'm of the opinion where we never lose sight of that. We, we never lose sight of our neediness. Um, I never, I never want to get in the place where I think I don't need him. I never want to get to that place where I think I can do whatever he calls me to do without him. I don't want to do anything without him. And I need a power that's far beyond me. I need a power to control my flesh. <coughs> my flesh is never good. And that's the thing that was a real super, um, I think, revelation for me as I began to grow, that, well, my flesh stays the same. It's still wretched. My flesh always is wretched. I can grow in Christ because he's given me a new nature. Now, I don't really have an old nature, but I still got a flesh. So he gives me a new nature that I can grow by, and uh, he gives me resources, which is the Spirit of God, that new nature, the Word of God, right? The family of God. He's given me all these things as resources to grow by, but man, if I don't look into these resources and these are not playing a part in my life, my flesh is my flesh. There's no power in the flesh. No, there's no power in it, but there's power to sin. I think the, the farther along you get with God, with Christ, the more you recognize your neediness. I, I think that's right. I think that's so exactly that, right. That you, you never outgrow the, if you will, the need for Christ to be in your life, for the Spirit to be working on all of the things that you already know, the, the issues of the flesh, 
the sinful nature and all that sort of thing. You never outgrow that. No, I don't think so. It's almost like, have you ever gone to a jewelry store and you look at diamonds? And often they'll take diamonds and they'll put them on a felt black background. And when you put them on your finger, they don't sparkle the same way. Because your finger isn't black. But when you put it against a black felt background, it really sparkles. What, what's the point? When you see how black you are, right? Christ sparkles. Christ is beautiful. Christ is more. So if you should think you're, you're no longer as black as you are, then it doesn't seem to be as special. But when you realize how terrible black you really are, from, I mean, the, the blackness of sin, then the beauty of Christ is that much more important and greater to you. So I don't think we ever, ever lose that aspect of um, the place of neediness, uh, nor the place that we can think that uh, even in our growth, that, that that wretchedness dissipates at all because the flesh remains the flesh. And you never trust it, and you never actually want to give yourself over to it. Now, many people do. Many people give themselves over to their emotions, to their feelings, to bad decisions, to selfish decisions. And these are the things that kill marriages. These are the things that destroy marriages. They destroy relationships. They destroy churches. They destroy everything. Uh, but when you uh, actually remember your condition outside of Christ, you see the great need you have of him. So there's many times, you know, you have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, <laughs> my attitude here is as black and as wretched and corrupt as it ever was. Please help me with this. Please help me with that. Please change my heart. Please work something in my life uh, that reflects you. Right? So we, we continually need this. So think about some of the people you know. Which ones seems self-sufficient? Which ones are aware that they need help from someone outside themselves? So which ones don't need help? Which ones do need help? And when God calls, and when God works, which one do you think he's working in? The one who's self-sufficient, or the one who remains to be needy? I think God has to work in both, because if you're thinking that you're self-sufficient, you're like the guys in Revelation that said, hey, I have need of nothing, and didn't recognize that they were poor, wretched, blind, naked, and all that sort of thing. Right. But then the people that recognize that they need help typically are looking for physical needs type help, not necessarily the spiritual thing. And so well, sometimes. God needs to work in both. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. But the self people who are self-sufficient, they often don't see the need. Therefore, because they don't see the need, then uh, they can't really, they don't go to God the way they should. Doesn't what, pride affect that? Oh yeah, pride is a very problem, a huge problem with mankind and, and people in general. Very, very prideful people. Yeah, Not humble, not submissive, not yielded. Prideful? Yep, right up there. It's one of the things that I think are killers to nearly everything. It, uh, it uh, destroys so many things. Um, all kinds of relationships. How do you, oh, how do you reach someone like, you know, I got a brother that's nicer than me and my other brother. We're saved and he's not, but he's a lot nicer guy. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in a way. Do I know what you mean? I mean, he's a nice, he really Oh, yeah, nice there's, there's some religious people who are in cults. They're the nicest people you ever want to meet, as far as, in a relative sense. Yeah. You know, in a relative sense. Uh, but uh, as far as before God, they're still in the condition that they're in. 
So if you're trusting in your niceness, and some people have been taught well or learned well, that there's some mannerisms that are good, or some mannerisms you want to adopt as yours. So I know that there's some very nice people that are very well-mannered, but they're lost as lost can be, um, but they hold certain values high. And so you'll see some people who are very well-mannered, but they have their own problems that are problems. Some of it is self-righteousness. You know, some of that is your, your self. So you look at somebody who doesn't have this particular mannerisms and you find it very easy to condemn, to look low, to condescend, right? Very easy. But when you see that you're, you're not very good or you're, you're in need or you you're, have your problems, often you have much more compassion on those when you see others who have their own struggles. Our, our culture tends to uh, work against humility. Oh, it absolutely and, does. I mean, you know, basically you're taught to, to be independent and self-sufficient and you don't need anybody and uh, that makes it difficult for anyone to admit that they got a problem. Yeah. And, and even worse to, to admit that they need help. Right. And so, I mean, culturally, that makes it difficult to relate to people uh, according to their need because they don't recognize <coughs> it. No, no, they don't. They don't recognize it. Sometimes leaders don't recognize it. Countries don't recognize it. You know, and individual people don't recognize Sometimes churches don't know it. Sometimes churches who are really strong, biblically, are sometimes some of the coldest people I've run into. Sometimes, sometimes, not all, not all the time. That's just kind of a general, you know, general statement. But sometimes, the people who are fundamental, you know, strong Bible believers, man, I've run into some Bible believers that are chilly people. <laughs> really, I mean, really chilly. Uh, I mean, you don't want to cuddle up to them because if you don't measure up to them in the way they think, you know, they they don't have any problem letting you know. Yeah, and you know, so it's very very difficult to, for us, especially as you grow in Christ and you do, you know, your life changes to think that you're better in some way. No, you're you're not better in any way. You're still the wretch you always were, but. God has been gracious to you, and the Lord is growing you, and you're not doing it. He's changing you. He's working in you. So, you know, you got to be careful about those type of things. And and uh, I think pride. I think remaining needy is just a good place to be. Just a good, good place to be. <clears throat> well, um, let, let's go down to uh, Mark two. 13 through 17. When we read the 13 through 17, this is Mark 2, 13 through 17. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was um, dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also uh, sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax uh, collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And then verse 17, When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, Levi, or Matthew, 
had a successful, though disreputable, job collecting from his fellow Jews on behalf of the Roman government that was occupying his country. What does this say about Jesus when he called such a person to be his disciple? He didn't judge him. He didn't judge him. He didn't judge him. And hopefully he would repent. Well, remember, Jesus always judges sin. So he doesn't accept sin. But what does he do? He calls sinners. So he doesn't accept sin, but he calls sinners. So what does he call them to? Repentance. repentance. He calls them to repentance. Now the Pharisees were appalled that Jesus shared a meal with the least reputable members of their society. Now, who today would be the equivalent of tax collectors or sinners in our day? Who would be the equivalent? The IRS. IRS? <laughs> okay, you're cuddling up to those people? <laughs> Okay, let me ask this question. With whom would fellow Christians be surprised to see you spending time with? Well, I prefer. Okay. Repetitive. Um, <coughs> you know, when they knowingly, consistently committing the same sin over and over and over again, they know what they're doing. And they know it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how would you view me if I was sitting with a homosexual? Or how would you view me if I'm now associating with a pedophile? You're on a mission. Or, or, or a rapist. <coughs> now, we don't do, we don't, we don't really, I don't come in contact with, you know, many people. Um, I live kind of a, I've lived kind of a sheltered life in a lot of ways. I used to have a jail ministry, you know, so I would come in contact with all kinds of different people there. I was in hospice, so I would come in contact with a lot of people who were dying. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, recent years, as I've gotten older, I've just not had as many um, ministries and not had as many associations, and so I don't come in contact with as many people who are in different lifestyles. But if I were to sit with a flat-out drunk, if I were to have over my house a pedophile, if I were to have over my house a rapist, or if I were to associate with on a regular basis such and such, what would people think? They'd be like the real deal, I guess. They'd be like the Pharisees. Yeah. Oh, hypocrite. Yeah. They'd look at me, wonder what he's up to. What is he doing with that person? Oh, Jesus associated with sinners so that he could reach out and save them, but we don't associate with sinners like that. We just don't come in contact with that. And, and we don't associate with that. We don't go out of our way to try to associate with that. So how many of us actually sit down and talk to somebody who's an actual homosexual? We usually say... <laughs> Well, they think of you as a hypocrite then, right? No, not necessarily. No. They, they would think of me of judging them, you know, because I stay away from them because they're the sinner and I'm not. I don't do that. That's not my lifestyle. I would condemn that, especially from the pulpit, I would condemn that. And if I would, con and I would condemn that to their face. I have sat with homosexuals and shared the gospel and they're unmoved they're just they're, they're totally unmoved they just have a hard heart it's a bunch of stories doesn't matter what you say they're not listening yeah they don't want to hear it there's no there's no question about that but i'm just saying how many sinners do we actually associate with and see if you don't see yourself as the needy person the wretch then you're never going to actually even if you have the opportunity to sit down with somebody, you're going to be more like a pharisaical mindset. You're going to see, you're going to see them as sinners, and you don't want to have anything to do with them. 
And even when you do have something to do with them, Kathy's, Kathy's experiences, I would say 90% of what you'll encounter, they don't want to have anything to do with you either. And how many times do you go back to them? You know, I cannot answer that. Jesus had a great deal to say about the Pharisees. What did he say about the Pharisees? That they were hypocrites. Well, in, even in our text that we read, what did he say about that? What was he saying to them? He said he didn't come to deal with those who don't need a physician. Yeah, he didn't, yeah, he, he didn't come to say, exactly, he didn't come to deal with those who are not sick. Or not well. He came to deal. He came to call those who are sick, sin sick, and there's a lot of sin sick people. And so we always need to remember, you know, our what we have been saved from, not lose sight of that. And in the same in the same way, in the same sense, Jesus never accepted sin, but he did try to reach out to sinners. He did associate with sinners. Trace? Oh, it, it's like kind of like, you know, I know how I used to be. So it's almost like when I look at these young people and they don't get it right now, but they're kind of listening. But it's like when I was young, you know, I thought I was halfway okay. I, you know, I just thought I'd be struck dead if I did anything wrong, but then I was doing things wrong every day. But I, you know what I mean? Right, I know. Yeah. I had that fear of God, but I didn't really know. So, like these young people, you know, it's like, I don't want to judge him, but I do. Now that I found the Lord, I know it's so off base. It's, so how do you handle that one, man? Well, well there's, there's still, when Jesus has made a statement concerning sin, okay? So, you know, uh, things like he hates divorce, but how many people have been in divorces? You know, thousands of people. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Well, how do we treat them? You've been a divorce. Jesus hates that. How do we treat them? I know my mother, when she got her divorce, she kind of, she never went to church ever again because of how people treated her. You know, she didn't, she didn't want to associate with anybody. Now, when I was young, we went to church occasionally. It wasn't like we were churchgoers. It was an occasional thing, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, Oh. And maybe something else, you know, the normal, the normal type of things that people do. That's the way my family was, but she would never step foot in a church. And the only time she stepped foot in a church is when I think I graduated, and she was there for my graduation, uh, which was a big deal. But uh, she, in years ago, there was a stigma, you know, with divorce. Now there's not a stigma because so many people have been divorced. Right? So many people have. It's in everybody's family everywhere. So there's no more stigma anymore. It seems to be a way of life with a society that we are now in. Just the way it is. But is it ever, is it right? No. God says no. He hates it. It reflects him and his church. So there's something special about a marriage, right? But yet, so many people have just discarded that. We, as believers, still think of ourselves as what? I'm still a wretch in the flesh. If it wasn't for Christ, I would be just like another person. Any other person? Well, there's an old saying that says, but by the grace of God, there go I. And that's a good place to be, right? So when somebody, whoever it is, somebody that I know God has already made a statement about, and they're in that condition, how do we respond? Well, I don't think it's right. I never think it's right. But that doesn't mean I'm better than they are. So then, therefore, I can now, can they rebuild their lives on things that are right? Yes. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. How many times have I re had to rebuild my life on that which is right and failed on many occasions? 
but still the Lord keeps kicking me where I need to be kicked and go on to the right road again, right up the right path again. And he does that over and over and over again. But we need to be careful when we're dealing with sin, people who are flagrantly in sin and don't want Christ. And I say, okay, you know, you make your choice, I'll give you a little better. But here's the truth, and I'll still tell you what I think is the truth according to what God said. And, you know, you still answer to God, you don't answer to me. I'm not your judge, I'm not your jury, but you still answer to God. And there still is sin, so that doesn't erase the fact. But is there still grace? Yes, yes there's still grace. Grace is what we offer people, and grace is how we respond. Grace is, grace is the key. Grace is how we respond. Can you love somebody who's still in sin? Yes, you can still love them. So if my son ends up getting a divorce, which it looks like it's going in that direction, because of his sin, can I still love him, but yet say, I'm not supporting that? Yes. What you're doing is wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we do as believers. I'm not telling you it's right. I'm not supporting that. But you're still my son. I still will love you. I still will associate with you. But you're still wrong. And you need to straighten that out with God. You need to straighten it out with your wife and your children. You need to straighten that out. And if they don't, that's still between them and the Lord. I can't do anything. I can't make them do that. Right? I cannot make them do what they need to do. But I can pray for them. I can support what's right. I can acknowledge what is wrong and still act graceful toward them. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is what Jesus does. You know, Jesus, Jesus associates with sinners. Jesus associates with me. I have never, ever not been a sinner. How about you? No. I mean, we're all sinners. Right. But we we're forget. Sinners, we forget sin. that our sin is just as black as their sin. And But by the grace of God, I've been made holy in Christ. But in me, I don't have any righteousness. I never had any righteousness. So we need to be careful the way we respond, right? We need to associate with sinners. And how are you going to actually associate with sinners? Yes. So because we're on the topic, if someone's sin is hurtful and, and, and harmful to an individual, like... Yeah, there's consequences that still go. I mean, if you break the law, you run a red light, and you kill somebody in the process, you're you're going to be subject to the law. I'm thinking, how does grace fit in? You know that that it always fits in. I guess is the answer. Well, well, like like Jesus, how did he associate with sinners? He tried to call them back to what? <coughs> Following him. And that's what we do. We try to point people to follow Christ. We try to point people to repentance. Now, if they don't want to, then I can let you go your way. You know, I don't have to necessarily support that. I'm not going to support, you know, certain, certain things that people do. But I can still graciously speak kindly, speak the right words, Speak graciously, not condescending, right? Because I'm higher and they're lower. No, no, I'm the same sinner you are, but God's grace has, has made a change in my life. And God's grace can make a change in your life if you accept Christ and the grace he provides. So it's a balancing act, yeah? Yes? I think it's a great responsibility of ours to pray for the grace to help those 
that recognize what their sin is. I mean, we hear hate the sin, but not the sinner. But it's very difficult, and I think we need a lot of grace to work with the person because you almost are what you do. It's very hard sometimes to separate that. I think you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not speaking as though this is easy, mm -hmm. and I don't think it is. But I just want to make sure for you and I that we have the right mindset that when we're dealing with sinners, that we are trying to direct them to follow Christ. And they may not want anything to do with it. And when they don't want anything to do with it, there's just consequences that just come with that. And I can't change the consequences. You know, though they have to face the Lord themselves. But I myself never want to think I am higher than anybody else. It's only because of God's grace that there's been any change in my life at all. So we just don't want to get pharisaical the way we actually deal with people. Make sense? We don't want to be like a Pharisee. I'd rather be like Christ himself in the way he deals with sinners. Jesus gives us the answer in John chapter 3 that he spoke to Nicodemus, Pastor. How would you say, how would you respond to the lost in regards to what Jesus says in John chapter 3? He tells Nicodemus you must be born again. Yeah. How, would you, how would you explain that to the lost? Well, you still uh, you still identify the person as a sinner in the sin that they're in. You know, Jesus never excused the sin, but he always calls sinners to repentance. And even like when he talked to uh, Levi, he, he just simply said, follow me. Well, what does that mean? It's a simple statement, but what does it mean? It, it, there's much more than yeah. than it, he was saying okay Matthew you're living this way right. you're following this thing but I'm now calling you to follow me now that sometimes it's a growing process okay. for me it was you know it didn't happen overnight I didn't understand a lot of things like most people don't understand a lot of things but Levi just did he just followed him. And this is the call that Christ has for sinners. Follow me. But that means you're going to live, you're going to leave some things behind. And you may not leave everything behind immediately, but there's some, but you are going to leave things behind. And so the 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 man that you're talking about, he changed his ways. What did he do? <coughs> Nicodemus? Yeah, what did he do? He gave up everything he had is in, in, in text. Well, he had a real hard time grasping what that meant, what he meant by being born again. He didn't yeah. understand it. Yeah. So he was a teacher in Israel, but Jesus explained to him, you know, in terms <laughs> that a Jewish mind would understand. Now, even we, in that explanation, find this a little bit difficult to grasp. But Nicodemus has a Jewish mindset and a Jewish background in the Jewish scriptures. And he could go to an Ezekiel 36 and explain the spirit of God now coming into a person's life. Because that was supposed to take place. And this is what Jesus is explaining to him, even without quoting Ezekiel 36. But this is what Jesus is explaining to him. He's explaining to him the spirit of God. It, it goes where you you can't see it, you don't know, but it's a work that's happening. And this is what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus. But our prayers for the sinner needs to be real, and it needs to be for repentance, and it needs to be for a changed kind of heart. A changed heart. So there are times where my prayers are, Lord, I don't really know what needs to take place, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what needs to take place. 
So if through a divorce, my son's heart finally gets right with the Lord, I say amen. If that's what it's going to take, it's not that's what I want. It's not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants something different. But if that's what it's going to take to get him right, then amen. I'm not, I'm not for it. The Lord's not for it. But if that's what it takes. So often in our prayers, I just simply pray, Lord, I don't know what it needs to take place, but I don't care what needs to take place. The loss of your leg, the loss of your eyesight, the the uh, the blessings of the lottery. I don't know what needs to take place in your life. I don't know. But if it will change your heart toward Christ, then that's my prayer. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So is it experiencing the consequences of your choices? Okay. Because there are consequences for sinful choices. And they automatically play off. There's a guarantee that sin brings you to a place you don't want to go. Right? It brings you to a place you don't want to go. Sin will do that. And the Lord now knows where sin has brought these people that he's sitting with. He knows that. And he's now calling them to himself because he knows what sin does. So he calls them to himself. So, and it comes with repentance, and it does come with a change of life. You know, that's what it comes. But we just need to be careful. We don't think we're higher. We associate with sinners. We call them to repentance. We don't accept the sin. We never say it's right. Okay, continue on in your sin. No, that's not what Jesus does. Even the woman who was caught in adultery, what did he say to her? Sin no more. Yeah, that ultimately that's what he said. So those who have no sin, you cast the first stone, right? So he was pointing out what to them? That they have sin too. Oh, they, yeah, you're as much a sinner as this woman is. You're as much a sinner as this woman is. So don't think you can cast a stone. But when it comes to dealing with that individual, that woman who was caught in adultery, She's, he specifically said, go and sin no more. That's where salvation actually takes place. That's what salvation does. That's what we pray for. That's what we pray for. Okay, we'll, we'll pick it up some more. Uh,